Welcome back. This week we are going to be making a tool holder for high speed steel parting blades. This particular tool holder is designed to be more robust, more versatile, and much more rigid than the typical tool holders that come with most quick change tool posts. And hopefully this more robust and more rigid tool holder is going to help to make parting operations on the small to medium sized hobby lathe a little bit more consistent and reliable and a lot less, well, pucker inducing. <laughs> If you have any of the various Allura style quick change tool posts, then you're probably familiar with this guy. This is the typical cutoff tool holder that comes with that style of tool post. And if you're familiar with these, then you may also be familiar with kind of how awful they are. Now, I am no cutoffologist, I'm no professional machinist, so I'm sure there are a lot of things that are good about these tool holders, and I know there are a lot of people out there who use them successfully and like them a lot. I, however, am not one of those people. I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into the weeds talking about all the different things that I don't like about this particular style of tool holder. So I'll just say that I find it severely limiting in both the size and type of cutoff blade that you can successfully use in one of these. And at least in my opinion and experience anyway, I have found that this entire design just seems to not be very rigid. It doesn't hold on to the tool very well. And all of these things combined just contribute to what I believe is making cutoff operations more difficult than they need to be. So with that being said, one of the very first things that I ever made was this tool holder right here. Now, I'm not saying that this is a very elegant or ingenious design. This tool holder was designed to address those few very simple problems that I just mentioned. I wanted something that was going to allow me to use a wider range of cutoff blades that was going to be more robust and rigid in its overall design and that was going to hold on to the cutoff blade tight enough so that I didn't ever have to worry about it getting away. And so far in my experience, this simple design has accomplished all of those things. It's definitely not perfect, but I find my ability to do cutoff operations when using this tool holder are much more reliable, much more consistent, and just overall a much smoother experience. Which is why when somebody asked me in the comments whether or not I had ever done a video on making this tool holder, I said no, but that sounds like a really great idea. A lot of the time on this channel, you see me making tools that I've designed but haven't actually used yet. So of course I hope that they're going to work great and that things are going to go the way that they go in my head, but I don't know because I haven't used them. This on the other hand, I have used extensively and have had a ton of success with. So for that reason, I thought that it would be a really great thing to share. Now, of course, I am not promising that this tool holder is going to solve all your woes, fix your marriage, and be some kind of magic bullet. But for me at least, and again, these are just my experiences, using this tool holder has brought my parting operations down to a pucker factor of basically zero. As usual, if you would like a set of drawings for this project so that you can follow along, you can find them on my Patreon. And without further ado, let's get started. Material selection for this project is going to be whatever I have that's relatively close to the right size. I think that this might be 1018 cold rolled, but I bought all this material in a bulk lot, so I'm really not sure. The first thing that I need to do is of course to square up the stock and to do that I'm going to be using the Joe Pie technique. Joe Pie has a great video on this explaining the technique in detail which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. The Cliff Notes version though is that by setting the stock high up in the vise like I have it gives me access to machine all of these exposed surfaces in the initial setup. By doing this, I ensure that all of these surfaces are going to be square and parallel to each other.
now when I flip the stock around and hold on to those surfaces, it's going to give me access to the opposing face, which I can now machine and be confident that it too is going to be square and parallel to those surfaces that I just machined. And because of the way that this technique works, I can go ahead and measure this dimension now, and I can start taking the stock down to its nominal dimensions as part of the squaring process. Now I have these two partly machined faces left that I have to deal with. So what I can do is remove one of the parallels from my vise, set the part back down, resting it on the machined part of one of those surfaces, leaving the unmachined surface sort of hanging out in space. And I'm now free to clean up the opposing surface, bringing it square with the surfaces resting against the stationary vice jaw and the one remaining parallel. And with that done, I can now bring back my second parallel, clean up this last remaining face, and at the same time, bring in my final major dimension. All right, so I'm all squared up. I've roughed in all of the major dimensions. So I have the general shape of my part and I'm ready to start working on features. I think that I'll begin by roughing in the dovetail. But before we do that, let's take a brief second to talk about dovetails and how to measure them. Because for this particular feature, you're gonna wanna measure for a good fit on your specific tool post. It's really easy and you just need a couple of things to do it. First, you're gonna need a matched pair of something that you can use as gauge pins. I'm just using end mills. You could use drill blanks or whatever you have. The important thing is that they are the same diameter and that they fit inside of your dovetail. You don't want them so big that they're spilling out over the top of the dovetail or getting lost in the corner. You want it to fit nice and snug inside of the dovetail just like that. Second, I am going to be using an expanding parallel. You could use gauge blocks, and if you don't have anything like this to fill this role, you could probably even get away with just using your calipers. But if you have something like gauge blocks or an expanding parallel, it's going to make it a lot easier to get an accurate measurement. And then the most important thing is you're going to want to grab a tool holder that is a really nice fit on your tool post. So once we have all that, there are a couple measurements that we want. First, we're just going to get the measurement of the overall slot, so the slot without the dovetails. To do that, I'll just take my expanding parallel and I will expand it until it just touches against those walls. And I'll just lock it down so that it doesn't move on me. And then take my measurement. I'll jot that down. And then next, you're going to take your two gauge pins, you're going to insert them into your dovetail, and then do the same thing to get that measurement. And that's basically it. So now when you machine your dovetail, you'll take your same gauge pins and you'll take the same exact measurement, just taking equal cuts off of either side of your dovetail until your two measurements match between your work and your existing tool holder. To get started machining the dovetail, I first need to rough in that overall slot. 
First, I'll find the center of my work using an edge finder, and then to rough in the slot, I'm just going to use a big one inch roughing end mill. And I decided to try out my fancy new cutting oil system that I installed on the machine. Let me just say, I knew it was going to be a mess. I mean, it's oil, right? Of course it's going to be a mess. But I feel like it's really easy to underestimate the size of the mess until you start voluntarily pouring oil all over your machine. And once I've got the overall slot cut out to size, I can move on to cutting the dovetail. To cut the dovetail, I'm using a Shars indexable dovetail cutter. It's almost too small for this job, but it's the only one I've got, so we're going to make it work. When machining the dovetail, I'm just using my existing center point that I found earlier as my reference, and then taking successive equal cuts from either side of the slot. Once the general overall shape of the dovetail starts to appear, I can stop, take a measurement, and then compare that measurement to what I got from my existing tool holder over on the bench. Whatever the difference is, I know that I can just divide that by two and take it in equal parts from either side of the dovetail. And that should be our dovetail. You can see the general shape of a tool holder starting to come in. I guess we might as well take it over to the lathe and give it a little test fit just to make sure it works. All right, hold your breath because if this doesn't fit, we made scrap metal. And it fits nice. That's actually a really good fit. And of course it fits. That's why we measured. And that's why I say make sure that you measure for your specific tool post before you cut the dovetails. Especially if you have an import tool post because the size of these dovetails can vary pretty significantly. Before I got this tool post, I had a no-name import. Same size, BXA, supposedly, but once I got this tool post, I quickly realized that my tool holders were not universal between them. The import tool holders would fit on the Alorus tool post, but they fit really loose, and the genuine Alorus tool holders would not fit on the import tool post. So basically, the dovetails on the import, again, same size, BXA, but the dovetails were significantly larger on the import tool post. So much larger that the Alorus tool holders wouldn't even slide onto the dovetail at all. So again, just measure, and as long as you measure and you're careful, you'll get a really nice fit. Next, I want to put in all these features on the front face of the tool holder. These are all pretty straightforward, and we can knock them all out in a single setup. So cutting the features into the front face of the part should be pretty straightforward. If you look at it from the side, it's really just sort of like cutting a bunch of different sized steps into the face. For that reason, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. There isn't really 
a lot of locating or any fancy math or anything like that that needs to be done for this. Like I said, it's really just like cutting in a bunch of different sized steps. Well, I don't know if you saw what happened there, but it isn't good. So let me explain the issue to you and then I'll show you the results. So this is the taper inside of that head. It's a modified 30 taper. It's a brown and sharp cam lock taper. But the basic idea is that it works a lot like a D series cam lock on a lathe spindle. You put this inside of the spindle. There's a cam that rides inside of this scoop, draws it up into the spindle and locks it in place. Tooling for this taper is incredibly difficult and expensive to find. So the guy that I bought the mill from gave me this modified 30 taper ER32 collet holder. This is something that he made himself and if I put these two right next to each other, I think that you can immediately see that there are a couple of problems. The first thing is he used a three quarter inch radius cutter to cut out this scoop. And if you look at the scoop, even by eye, you can tell that that isn't the correct size and two seconds with an end mill will tell you that this is a one inch radius. So that's the first problem. The second problem is there's this second bit of geometry at the top here, this flat spot. That is what the cam actually locks against when it draws this up into the spindle. I say all that to tell you that this thing has never really worked well inside of that spindle. It will draw up into the spindle and if you really crank down on it, it will lock into place. Now, I knew it was an issue, but I haven't bothered to modify it yet because it seemed to be kind of working. So this is completely my fault. But the problem is that it seems to work fine until it doesn't. And I was trying to take a heavy cut and it was enough to just pull this thing right out of the spindle and into the work. And the result is this nasty gash here. I finished machining this first feature, which is this bottom little piece here, which is where the dovetail will go. It's what the cutoff blade sits in. I finished machining this just to see how bad it was, and it's pretty bad. I mean, that's a good 50 thousandths deep, and it happened when I was well into the work, so it comes in pretty far as well. So I'm just going to come out and say it, that sucks. What an absolute bummer. That thing was really starting to look nice. It's really shaping up. I'm not going to let this stop me. Uh, we'll go ahead and put the rest of the features in that face and, you know, see how it looks. I'm sure it's going to work fine. It's just going to look like crap, which, you know, sucks. I guess I'm going to have to try and figure out a way to modify that thing and fix it. I don't know how he managed to cut it in the first place. I mean, it's hard as flipping nails, but you know, I'm going to have to figure out something because the only other tool holder that I have is this one. It's a half inch end mill holder. So I guess I'll use this from here on out. Just use a smaller cutter and do everything in a lot more passes. So yeah, I guess that's that. I mean, it's a huge bummer that it happened. <laughs> it was uh, pretty stressful in the moment, but you know, everything's calmed down now. Uh, we've got a plan of attack and you know, let's just uh, get back to work. All right, so we'll finish up these features on the front face here. And as the general shape starts to come in, you're going to see what I mean about it really just being a series of different sized steps and how it should have been just a bunch of pretty straightforward operations. But I guess as they say, the best laid plans and all that. Here is a look at our progress thus far. You can see that big gouge from here. 
and here's a bit of a better look at it. But if you just look at this section, it doesn't look too bad. You can see all the major features have been machined and it's really starting to take shape aside from this nasty piece right here. There's still a good bit of work to do. We have several holes to drill and tap. We still have to make the clamp piece, which is on this second sheet here. So there's still a good bit to do yet. However, I have completely run out of time for this week, which unfortunately means this is where we're gonna have to wrap things up for now. You'll just have to tune in next week to see the exciting conclusion of me crashing my milling machine. And maybe we'll even finish making a tool holder while we're at it. All joking aside though, I am really bummed about what happened. And after all the work that I've been putting into that machine over the last couple of months, the very last thing that I wanted to do was crash it the first couple of times that I used it. But you know, I knew that that tool holder was a potential problem. I took a risk and I have to deal with the consequences. Unfortunately though, this is really the only tool holding option that I have for that vertical head. Like I said, I have that half inch end mill holder that I found on eBay, but I think I paid like 65 bucks for that single end mill holder. And trying to find another one is like trying to find golden hen's teeth. So I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I gotta figure something out. I guess my best option is to try and modify this thing. Like I said, I don't know how he cut it in the first place. I mean, it is hard as nails, but you know, I'll just have to figure something out. Maybe you'll see a video about it sometime in the future. As usual, if you have made it this far into the video, thank you so very much. I do truly appreciate each and every person who watches, especially when you watch this far into the video. It lets the algorithm know that you enjoyed it, which means that it will be shared with more people. So thank you. And of course, a very special thank you to my patrons, the people who find value in what I do. I still don't understand why you do, but I do appreciate it more than you could possibly imagine. If you are already a subscriber, thank you for that as well. If you haven't subscribed, but you like what I do here and you feel like I've earned it, give me a like and a subscribe. If you feel like I haven't, let me know what I can do better in the comments down below. And as always, until next time, Get out there, make something awesome, try not to crash your machine, most importantly, have some fun, and I hope to see you all again very, very soon.